this is going to be a slightly different podcast than we normally do. Uh, instead of doing a chapter or a particular subject, we're actually uh, sat down with Jason Denzel, the uh, founder of DragonMount.com and the author of Mystic. He's someone who got to know Robert Jordan personally, and uh, we talked for a couple hours and uh, had some pretty far-ranging conversation that I found really interesting. I'm excited to share this with you. Uh, and I hope you really enjoy it. If you want to skip to various topics, there should be timestamps in the show notes. And if your podcast player supports chapters, uh, those should be in there as well. This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. I got to say, Jason, you got the sh- our show started, you know. We put it up there on Reddit on day one, and, and you tweeted it out. I yeah, think, I, I remember. It was a great first episode. I remember listening, like, hey, this is great. Cause, you know, there's you know, there's, a, there's at least, you know, one other real-time podcast out there. But, you know, uh, it was neat to see some variety and see a different approach that you guys are taking. So that's great. Thanks. Yeah, I, the, a lot of them were pretty high level. Uh, we wanted to go uh, not high level. <laughs> <laughs> pretty low level. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, that was a huge, you know, we were really excited when we saw you tweet us out. and uh, Yeah, that was really encouraging. And then our downloads yeah. exploded for a minute there. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think I think that gave enough, us enough of an audience that we continued to grow from there. But that, that initial tweet was a huge help to us. So I, I just wanted to say thank you right off the bat because you've... Well, it's, it's my pleasure. And having having been someone there who... At one point, was you know begging for tweets and or not tweets, but for you know spreading the word. I understand, and also yeah, we should. I want to do more of it. To, you know, now that the site's back up, I, I'd love to. I'm trying to get more social media more integrated with our site, meaning I want to use it a little bit more because we 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 have it, but we haven't really really leveraged it before, and so I'd like to start having more content that I put out there, and that means. You know, uh, we're not for the longest time. Yeah, it, it's it, hard for the to manage time. all the platforms together, especially when you have one main thing. Mm-hmm. It's difficult mm-hmm. to pay attention to, you know, seven, eight, whatever Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. The, it's like a job you're, by you're itself. Totally right. And we, yeah, there's a couple of people that just help us out in the staff to just to handle all that sort of thing. You know, one of the things that's changed over the years for us at, at Dragon Mount is that. You know, and for most of the time that we were around, um, and certainly in the earlier days, anything that we wanted to share was either content that we came up with or news that we had discovered and were sharing out. So we were the primary source of news. But, you know, that isn't the world today anymore. The, the world today is that it's everything is is out there and it's um, more about going out and finding that content and retweeting it and sharing it and spreading it. And, you know, there's the blog or the news page is only one portion of that. And it's a great point, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I've had to, in order to stick around and be relevant, <laughs> you know, we've had to shift our, our thinking a little bit um, from, you know, how do we generate content to how do we find content and share it and, and then, you know, and when appropriate, mm. add to it. Is that what uh, sort of spurned the re- uh, spurned, spurred the redesign for Dragon Mount, just sort of a different approach to the, the information around the show and, uh, a or is it just bit. that it was I mean, really out of date? <laughs> it was just really out of date. I mean, I mean like, I, I like the thing of it was this big noble thing, like you were saying, but, uh, no, it, it mostly was that it was out of date. The, the you know the forum software we had was approaching ten years old, and the, the servers, although the servers um, have just been amazing, they're they're still running and they're still going, and they're still decent machines that can handle the load and everything. But you know, but like the operating systems on there were now you know, six or seven years. Old. I'm, I'm beginning to worry about vulnerabilities and you know what, what's out there. And yeah, I can safely say that now that our servers are on, you know, up to date. Up to the you know up to the hour patches and everything we're good to go. But on these other servers, man, they're God knows what kind of vulnerabilities we had in those things for a while. It was just time to upgrade them, and I needed to to do that. But I knew uh, also too, like you know, we did not have a web a, a mobile friendly website. Which come on, you know, it's it's 2018 now. You know, uh. <laughs> it's time to have a, a mobile friendly website. And so, at this point, everyone, most of your 
Yeah. Viewership is probably on mobile. Probably. You know, I haven't looked at the, 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 the breakdown, you know, the Google Analytics in, in a while. And uh, totally. pr- probably because I've been too afraid to see what it would say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do a good amount of my browsing on mobile because, yeah, sure. you know, it's when I'm like, sitting in a cab or waiting for my food in a restaurant or something. That's when I'm reading yeah. the news, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Or I'm looking or up facts doing while doing the podcast and I'm, I pull out my phone really quick and, and look something up, even though I've got the computer right in front of me. Yeah. It's right. We've got like six screens down here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Dragon Mountain has been around for, oh gosh, when did it start? 90... Eight. Nine, 98. Yeah. 98. Eight. Yeah. So wow. this is our 20th year. Yeah. This will... Our 20th birthday is this fall, so we're going to be doing, I don't know what exactly, but we're going to be doing something big and fun. That's incredible. That's awesome. Because I, you know, for me, reading the Wheel of Time FAQ was where I first got my start on the internet with the Wheel of Time. And when you guys integrated that, that's when I found Dragon Mount and really sort of, I started using it as a major source of information, you know, and it's been just a, a great website for, um, I'm sure the last 20 years <laughs> and just a source for every, all the fans. So I want to say thank you about that too. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. That's very yeah, nice. That's thank you. Pretty incredible that you, you got out there. Like that's, I feel like that's just when I was becoming aware of the internet. I mean, I'm a little younger than Seth, but 98, I was 11. There's definitely um, a, a story there with, with that whole thing. You're, you're right that, you know, you said that you, it was right around 98 that you were becoming aware of the internet. Well, that's exactly it. Is yeah. that, you know, right 1998, a lot of it was just, you know, really good timing in that people were starting to get off of Usenet and get off of AOL and, and starting to find the internet as we know it. And so when in 1998, I was dating myself, I'm 20, I was 20 years old at the time, I was in college and I was taking a, um, you know, I was rereading the series because Path of Daggers was about to come out. And so I was rereading the most recent books. And, oh, man. I know, right? And, and uh, good times. <laughs> so I'm rereading the series. I'm in college. And I really wanted to talk to people about this. I really wanted to geek out in a big way. I wanted to talk about all the theories. I wanted to, you know, say what was going on. And I wanted to come up with whatever my crazy theories were at the time. And I didn't have a lot of people yeah. to talk to about that. And my roommate, or my, one of my former roommates, I guess, or a friend or something, he had read the book, but he just wasn't into it. So I didn't have anyone to really geek out you know, with on the level that I wanted to geek out on this thing. And so I went online, you know, and uh, I know at the time that there was a forum at wheeloftime.com, which at the time... Wheeloftime.com was the official website for the Wheel of Time video game adaptation. You guys remember that? It was from, and it was. I've only heard of it. I yeah, never played it, it. Did you ever play it, Seth? I never got a chance to. I saw that it existed back in the day, but I didn't have a computer that could run it. And then now it's so. <laughs> you, <know, laughs> you don't have a computer that can run it. Think some things never change. <laughs> yeah, it was it was an interesting game. It was um, just a, a quick tangent on that is that it was a um, it was a 3D shooter, which was the most obscure thing. I mean, like you know, how do you make a yeah? A so shooter. you you played the did you like throw you fireballs? played the role of an Aes Sedai, but the you were not. I think you were either an accepted or a novice. Maybe someone in the audience can correct me on these details, but you were either a novice or an accepted. Because you had, I think the, the, the hook was that you hadn't yet taken the three vows, so that could explain why you could, you know, attack people with stuff. And you had a shooter, and <laughs> the way, like the ammo that you picked up were terangrials. Because apparently across, all across Randland, you could just pick up terangrials wherever you went, and that would be your ammo to cast <laughs> spells, you know? And, um, Snakes and Foxes is saying she couldn't channel at all, and it was. Is that what it is? Okay, yeah. something something along those lines. But the point is, is that it was yeah. a three D shooter, <laughs> and for the time it had, it was using you know that was back when when Unreal Two was about to come was out. Quake Engine. Quake. I think it was the Unreal Engine, one of the earlier Unreal Engines. Okay. And it was um and it Ooh, you know looked good for the time, and it's been a while since I looked it up, but I don't think it would look you know it probably looks dated, of course, by today's standards, but it was still pretty cool at the time, and. 
it had this also this unique game mode, I think, where you could build your own fortresses and you could lay traps and stuff. Again, things that no Aes in the book ever did, but but what the heck, it, it was, you know, fun. <laughs> You could at least pretend that you were an Aes Sedai, and you could, yeah, or at least a and... a woman who could channel Terangrials, <laughs> you know, or something, right, 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 or whatever. <laughs> Which somehow yeah. makes sense. So, um, so that game was in development at the time. I think it was finally released in '99 or something around there, or maybe nine, uh, or maybe it had already been out for a year. I, I can't remember exactly. But um, at the time, WheelOfTime.com was the website for that game. And it and it also had a forum, and so a lot of fans hung out there because it was a you know Wheel of Time forum. Also, there was Wheel of Time org, which was another Wheel of Time forum. And you you know in hindsight, I don't ever know what happened to Wheel of Time org. I mean, they're they're both obviously offline now, and I just checked. Yeah, neither of them. They're both available for sale. I think. Every now and then I get a, an email saying that wheeloftime.com is available and for sale and it would cost $70,000. And so I, you know, and I've thought to myself, you know what? I bet if I really tried, I could probably do a Kickstarter or a GoFundMe and get enough people <laughs> to buy a wheeloftime.com. I don't know what I would do with it. It would just forward to Dragonmon or something. But but that price, you know, I'm... My guess is that it'll get picked up eventually by, you know, Sony or something when, you know, if... That's what I assume is that Sony would have picked it up before uh, optioning the TV show. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, you know, I, I thought, I don't know, maybe maybe uh, maybe $70,000 or whatever the price is, maybe that's even too steep for, for Sony. Maybe we'll like, ah, let's just go get wheeltime.org instead. <laughs> that takes a chunk out of the mm. budget. I spoke too soon before, by the way. Uh, .org is still there. .com is Wheel of Time TV is picked up these days, and it's run by Narg the Trollock. And um, Narg yes. is, um, man, he is uh, uh, he, he's my favorite Wheel of Time site these days to, to go and uh, to visit. He's got, <laughs> he's got all sorts of great stuff, and he's really active in social media as well. And um, Oh, I definitely use his likes to find him on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah. Like I, I, I scroll through them and, and if he's liked your tweet, I've definitely followed you on Twitter. Oh, this just is like, a nice looking website. Yeah, he's good. He, and he just interviewed you, uh, Jason. He did. Day. And well, technically he interviewed me about a month ago. I just happened to respond to his email earlier this week. So that's when, uh, it was sitting yeah. in my inbox for a long time. But yeah, it was, it was fun to talk. Well, to you've been pretty busy getting, uh, getting the reboot up with Dragon Mouth. That was way more work than I thought it was going to be. I, I knew it was going to be a major upgrade. I knew that we would need, it wasn't just going to be something that I could like, you know, install the new software and run an install script and boom, we'd be upgraded. The software we were running, which the whole site runs, it's not WordPress, but it's, you know, it's one of these other big uh, suites that, you know, does the forums and the entire entire thing it's all one big software package and we've got every option enabled and we've got the store option we've got the forums we got the blogs we've got you know all that kind of stuff all plugged in and to do the upgrade was going to require a new site redesign like you know all the html code that we had built in the previous version was going to break and they were upfront about this and so i when i um hired a, uh, a a designer someone who had worked with that stuff before and so came in and did that and that was fine and that took a little bit longer than we had wanted and that was not necessarily a knock on the designer at all he, he did a great job it was just the the interface of working with it was left a little bit to be desired so also <laughs> you know we he and i had talked about like you know, how big the site is and we went through the site and we did you know and we kind of browsed through it to kind of get a sense of the scale and then we found all this content that was just buried way deep down and it ended up being more work as we didn't, neither one of us had realized how big the site was, you know, than we initially thought. <laughs> and then the final thing. It's like when you go to pull a tree out uh, by its roots and it's just got that one tap. It just keeps going and, and going and, and going. And yeah. Well, yeah. It uh-huh. just keeps going. So, and then the last part is the online store. So, you know, Dragmon has a, a like dragmon.com slash store. If you go there, we, we, sell DRM free ebooks for a huge portion of Macmillan's offerings. Macmillan, the big bookseller who Macmillan owns Tor Books, who publishes 
the Robert Jordan books and the majority of Brandon's books, all his big epic fantasies, and also my books. Mm-hmm. And so Tor, we have this whole system set up where on a weekly basis, I get a deliver of the server gets a, a weekly secure FTP delivery of eBooks and metadata to kind of go with it. And so that I can you know, populate this store and, uh, and have all these um, titles for sale and you can download, you, you know, buy them and then stick them up on your uh, Kindles or iPads or whatever. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a nice. real nice system. But what they do is that. I've definitely, you know, become a huge fan of the e-reader. It's something that, that, you know, I, th- I think I've picked up and just I, I highlight my books and I write notes in them and I can do all that just in my e-reader and, and it syncs between my diff- various devices. And I, I love e-books. You know, I, I still love the old paperbacks. They're wonderful. And they, the smell of them is something. <laughs> Everyone that's always talks about the smell. But I can't put a thousand of them in my pocket. I use a paperback for the podcast that I read directly out of. I don't know. I guess I, because I can get it closer to my face, I think I, I feel like I can read more fluidly from it. But... It doesn't make sense to keep buying paper over and over. I've probably bought the Wheel of Time series like four times now. Well, and that's just the point is that, you know, when, when ebooks first started coming out, everyone, you know, there was this big, you know, war that kind of continues on today, this big debate about, you know, like, you know, which is better? Is our ebooks going to totally replace books? And, you know, I don't think so. I think what we've found is that, I mean, there are definitely something nice about, you know, having an e-reader. I've got, well, I had a Nook, now I use my iPad, you know, whatever. But but I've got, a, you know, I, I consume a lot of content on those devices, but I also have a lot of print books. And I find that for the books that I love the most, for the Wheel of Time books and, you know, for the ones that I'm real passionate about, I tend to buy them twice. Sometimes... In some could be them. I live in crazy land. I, sometimes I buy them three because I also buy the I also buy the audio the, the Audible edition. Sure. And so, a great example is books by Nora Jem, N.K. Jemisin, the Broken Earth trilogy. And um, I'm just making my way through the third one right now, and I, I love those books. The first two won the Hugo Award. I have been trying to get Patrick to read them. I every yeah, like, I think it was like the last those. three podcasts. I was like Patrick. You have to read the Broken Earth. They are amazing books. I think you even yeah, they, yeah. I have I have the files too. Yeah, and so like I've got you know I because I think what happens is that I was like okay, what's the big deal about these books? I'm hearing so much about them, so I pick up you know the, the Kindle edition, and then I'm like, this is fantastic, but I'm not having a chance to read as much, and I want to know what happens. So I get the Audible thing, and I listen to it when I'm in the car or walking my dog or whatever, right? And then on top of that, I'm like, wow, these are so good. I want to have these on my shelf. <laughs> and so I buy a nice hardcover or whatever, you know? And so that's how I end up with, you know, paying Nora Jemison, you know, three times, which is fantastic. And, you know, I'm glad to be able to do so. You know, The Magicians by Love Grossman. I've got the digital copies and I've got hardcover copies. Same thing. Those are, I love those books. So, yeah. And maybe this guy, Robert Jordan, you know, I, I've yeah. got a... Uh, a couple copies. of, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe just 13 or 14 copies of Eye of the World somewhere in my house right now. You know, I, I can't hold on to them. I give them away so much. Like, I, I, I honestly do not have a copy of Eye of the World right now because I gave my last one away. That was, like you, I've had this problem with this. I, I've given so, I can't even count or remember how many I've given away. And two, and at one point, I got smart years ago. Oh man, it was again probably maybe not quite ten years ago, but maybe five or six years ago. Anyway, I realized I was giving away so many of these things, and so I just like asked Tor. I just was like, "Hey, I just I'm giving these things away. Like, can you just send me a box of them?" <laughs> not expecting anything, and sure, they sent me a box of like forty of these books awesome. yeah, of the Eye of the Worlds. And you imagine how big that box is, like you know, like <laughs> seven hundred page paperback, right? Yeah, you know, and they've done that twice for the because they're like, oh, do you want the new editions or the old, you know? And, and it's like whatever. And then a year later, when I'm out of those, you know, they said, you know, hey, do you want? We got these new editions. You want them? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so yeah, so I I think I still have some of those down and you know downstairs. It's basically somewhere. the drug dealer strategy of the first one is free, and then there's oh, 13 yeah. more to hook you on. <laughs> sure, you're absolutely right. And with the, something like the real time that absolutely works. And in fact, did you guys, did you know that like back in the, when it was first coming out in the, in the early nineties, Tor actually gave away for free. They, they gave away, they had a 99 cent edition and a free edition of the first half of the eye of the world. And so 
you can still find those, and um, they're actually pretty rare, and therefore pretty they're rather collectible. Yeah, that's funny. So they really did yeah. make the first bag free. <laughs> they really did, yeah. And it was just it was the first half, which later years later they turned it into from the two rivers. That's right. Oh, I've seen that title floating around. Yeah, for the people who are listening who might not be familiar with it, the Eye of the World. Once the Harry Potter cra- uh, craze took you know took off in the early two thousands and was going crazy and uh, and lots of young readers were finishing Harry Potter, were getting through you know the middle of the Harry Potter books when they were coming out, and were voraciously looking for more fantasy content. Tore through their Starscape publishing label um, or imprint. They what they did is that they took the eye of the world and they cut it in half. And the first and then what they did is they added some more content into this. So the first half of the eye of the world is called From the Two Rivers. And what they did is that Robert Jordan wrote a new chapter to go before the Dragomop prologue. It's called Ravens. I've read that chapter. Yeah. And it, it features a nine year old Egwene. Uh huh. And, you know, thinking about like, you know, like, you know, she, you know, she was going to be the best water hauler ever because, you know, she was going to not let anyone, especially that, you know, wool headed nincompoop Randall Thor, you know, be better than her or something. Wait, so, wait, wait. So a queen's nine years old in this? I've never yeah. read this. Oh, you, yeah. yes, you did. I sent it to you. You did? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> What's so it it's it. It's called, oh. it's called, the chapter is called Ravens. And it's, um, you'll find it in From the Two Rivers. So Tor, just this year, just a few months ago, re-released From the Two Rivers in a nice hardcover collector's edition that has a gorgeous cover, and, and you can find it online. I'm sure someone in the you know, comments can, or we can link to it in, the, in your show notes afterwards or whatever. Sure, but. they've already sent it to us uh, in the comments. So Yeah, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at I'm looking at the covers comments. that they – I see a couple uh, – someone um, you know, posted up that, uh, that image. And those are the old covers. There's a newer cover for, for the first one for, from the two rivers. Hmm. So, yeah, so it includes this new chapter. There you go. Someone just put up another one with that new cover. With the, That's Snakes and Foxes. <laughs> snake, <laughs> snake wheel logo. Ooh, that's nice looking. Yeah, it is, and um, so that's a bit. I mean, that's you. It's probably in all you know, whatever bookstores, U.S. and Canada, anyway. So yeah, so Ravens was added as a new chapter, and then the book goes through uh, through I think the end of Shadar Logoth after they escape Shadar Logoth, and then for the second half of the Eye of the World, called To the Blight, you know, obviously you know it's all about their adventures going into the Blight, and it's through the end of the book. What they added was an expanded glossary at the end. Now, what was unique about that <clears throat> was because you think, oh, gee whiz, you know, who, who cares, an expanded glossary. And this is, you know, before the Wheel of Time Companion was out. Yeah. But the glossary had some really interesting things in there. Because, for instance, it, it, it was the first time that it, it had an entry for the Ring of Tamerlin, which is something that Luz Theron makes a reference to in the Dragonmount prologue. And the talks about the Ring of Tamerlin, and it says that the Ring of Tamerlin was won, was worn in the Age of Legends by supposedly by the person who first learned the channel. So it's essentially a thing that in the Age of Legends they had this legendary item that was mysterious to them. So it kind of implied that like this is like a thing that came from like the first age or something something that old. You know, it's really. Makes you kind of wonder: Is you know, was Tamerlin the name Umpar of a the horn. person? Was it the name of a, you know, was it a title? Would it become both? So that was something that uh, that he expanded. Another entry in that glossary that was expanded that was really kind of um, fun was going off the top of my head, and again, you know, maybe someone can correct me on the details. But I think someone, I think they posted about the Nine Rods of Dominion, which is another thing in that uh, Dragonmont prologue that mm-hmm. Elon Morin, you know, balls him on to be. He um, says, you know, you know, once you summon the nine rods of dominion, you know, to which you think, okay, yeah, so yeah, Luz there and back in his heyday, he was able to summon these nine rods or stabs or something like that. And later in the series, you kind of wonder, you know, are those, you know, are, are those, you know, some people speculated throughout the years that, yeah. you know, that maybe it was a reference to that, you know, one of those nine became an oath rod, you know. I, and, I thought they were uh, the oath rods for a long time. Yeah, and so that's what a lot of people kind of thought. You guys probably may have talked about it on your show. Well, again, look up the reference in the back of the book. But apparently, the rod was a person. 
<laughs> like no. not like from a named rod, you know, that would be kind of funny. But like the nine rods of Dominion were, it was a title. There were nine people and they were called the rods of Dominion. And I'm going to feel really foolish if that's not accurate, but I, I'm almost 95% you're, you're certain that that's right biggest. That. Yeah. Is that it? Okay. Yeah. yeah so the, uh, the I nine... always thought of them as a, a mistranslation uh, from the old tongue as the call, the, the pillars of Dominion. Mm. Yeah, like, so I like that. think of like the people who support the well, makes Dominion. Sense. They would not just yeah. be rods, but actual columns. I always kind of, of thought support. of it as like like the oath rod. Maybe it's like a staff of office, like a gavel, or like if you were to summon the gavels, you summon the judges. Type. Yeah, that would make yeah, sense. Yeah, could be something like that. I imagined it. You know, it, it, here we are, and we're, we're discussing it, and you know, whatever it is any of the encyclopedia is kind of the final word, or, or excuse me, and the companion is kind of the final word on this, whatever, but. <laughs> I also kind of wonder, you know, having now my own experience of having, you know, written, you know, a, a small handful of, of books and other lengthy projects, I kind of wonder if it was like Robert Jordan sitting at his desk saying, and you summoned, I don't know, the nine rods of dominion, and he forgets about it for a decade and comes back and like, oh, yeah, what were those rods exactly? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so maybe it was yeah. something like that. You, you know, foreshadowing is always a bit of a mix of – Leaving yourself open hooks and deliberate planning, it seems to be. Yes. And Robert uh-huh. Jordan was the master of blending those two together. Yeah. Who knows which for, is which? Yeah, for sure. There's you know some things that he um, you know foreshadowed early on in those early books, and even in the pre-release notes that he had, you know, just there were some crazy things that he mentioned that absolutely came true in the final couple of books, and. Mm-hmm they were spot on. And, you know, then then we all know there are a couple things that he put in there that's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's almost like he forgot about him and kind of had to squeeze him in in the last couple books before, or or Brandon may have had to just squeeze him in the last couple books. But, you know, we'll we'll, we'll never know, I guess, fully. You guys see the uh, recently about Adam Whitehead posted an article about he had a chance to look at the uh, the early notes that Robert Jordan had, like, you know, the a lot of these notes that were donated to the, I think, to the College of Charleston. It was a and, fascinating read. I did not read yeah. that. Because it was really, it revealed some things that, I think the big reveal away from that was that for a while, Jordan did support the Tam Demandred crossover as the same character. And then that was one of his early ideas. And then he switched. But there were a bunch of other really interesting ideas in there. I, you know, it just came when out. Just so I, I read out. through it, but I haven't had a chance to really think about it. And I definitely want to talk about that on the podcast because it was it was really fascinating. Well, the first hit on Google was the link on Dragon Mount talking about it. Yeah, that's I mean, that's yeah. how I found it. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. So, the you know, to, to give some context for you know, people who might be scratching their heads, what happened was that after Robert Jordan died... Well, let me back up even further. <laughs> in Robert Jordan's home in Charleston, he has uh, what's you know, you know the, the the infamous carriage house, which is this you know whole separate building that is separate from his physical home there in Charleston, and it's where he did all his writing. And in this carriage house, which back in the day was an actual carriage house, it's, it was years and years and years ago. It was, it was converted into a you know a study and a library. Is is that like a barn, basically? Basically, yeah. And imagine a barn, garage. you know, multi, multi-story multi barn slash garage thing. I mean, it basically is a separate house at this point. There's no giant carriage door or anything like that anymore. But, and there's photos on it. I mean, Google Robert Jordan Carriage House, and uh, you'll find some great photos. Some that I took when I, on my various visits, but others by other people who have visited over the years. And one of the, and inside there, ah. Uh, Again, my memory's fuzzy on the exact number, but I want to say it was something like 12,000 books is what he had inside this carriage house and that, from his personal collection. And walking in there, I had the opportunity, shortly after he passed away, I was invited out by, by his family and I was able to go out and attend his funeral. And, that is uh, that freaking was, special. I'm not being that, sarcastic. It was That's really awesome. special. And it was a real honor. They invited me to kind of be there and to represent the fans and also to be able to document it so I could share it back with the fans. It was one, it was such a great honor. It, it, it was as, it was more amazing than you can imagine. I'm not trying to do that to rub it in and make you guys feel jealous. Right? <laughs> but it, but it, was, it was, I'm not going to lie. It was pretty unspecial. And, uh, I, I can uh, believe that. That's 
Yeah, yeah somewhere on, on my on Dragon Mount, and I forget exactly where, but somewhere on my Dragon uh, on Dragon Mount is my report that I, I did a big long write up, complete with photos about the whole experience. So you can read about it there. But yeah, so you walk into this carriage house, and I remember you walk in, and there's this like there's a full human size human skeleton like an actual size human skeleton standing right there by the door and it's like wearing like a pirate hat and holding a gun or something <laughs> like that you know just and and then you know on your left there are statues of you know every deity from every world religion you know they can see along the you know cool. the, the, um, on the bookshelves there's books from everything he's got he's got a copy of a game of, of a game of thrones in the first book, in the first one, uh, you got Game of Thrones there, and it's signed by George Martin, and inside there's a printout that says, you know, dear, and I forget who publishes, you know, on uh, Game of Thrones, but, you know, dear publisher, I very much enjoy the Game of Thrones. Could you please have George R. R. Martin send me a, a signed copy? Sincerely, Robert Jordan. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and so that's sitting right there, you know, and that's pretty amazing. There's this... There's pictures of you know his family and of himself and Harriet, especially when they're much younger, that are hanging up on the walls. Is that There's, where the famous weapons collection is? That's where the I've famous always wanted weapons to see collection that. is. It, it's the weapons collection has been dispersed amongst fans over the years. It's no longer there, is my understanding. Oh. But he did have you know thousands of of swords and weapons and various things. One of those made it in into my house, which I'm very honored to to have today. That was a uh, oh, I'm cool really one. jealous. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, I almost it obviously it, it's special. It, it it's something that you know every fan who received a uh, one of these things, you know, probably treasures it and everything. But I, again, I kind of wonder how much of this was Harriet saying, like you know, here let's share Rob Jordan with the world, and also. Let's just get this junk out of the carriage. Like, <laughs> it's too much crap but, here. <laughs> yeah, right. I, 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 I want to be able to. Jordan describe himself as a hoarder. Uh, he's like, I collect things. I, well, I listened to that audio clip you posted recently, and that was really well done. And I think in there, he he talked about himself as a, a collector of, of various things, um, yeah, including he, swords. I, I, he definitely collects lots of, but the other things that, like you know, when you picture a hoarder, you know, you, you, there's a messiness factor to it. I did the carriage house was. I wouldn't say it, it was well kept and, you know, mm-hmm. like the, the books were all there and, you know, the swords were there, but they were all hung on the wall. And for the most part, you could walk through the carriage house unhindered. So where, where did we start with this? There was a carriage house. What was it? Oh, the notes. So after he died, Harriet was, you know, indeed kind of cleaning house. And I, 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 I'm not saying that she was doing it just to get rid of all the junker. That, that's not what I'm implying. What I'm saying is that she um, was looking to a lot of these things. I mean, there there is some historical significance to a lot of this stuff. And so she donated just, yeah, I think what they did is that they went through and they gathered all the relevant notes that were going to be necessary for Brandon to do his task. And a lot of that stuff was going to have to be filed and sorted. And Robert Jordan, what he did, apparently he liked to print things. Like he would get emails and digital files and he would print everything. And so even down to like, supposedly even he and I exchanged emails for a while. And so apparently I even had a file, you know, the the Jason Denzel file that had (laughs) emails and correspondence between the two of us with that's old school, uh, with, I think, is what that is. It is pretty old school. And what was interesting, too, is that, you know, he and I, we, we talked about Wheel of Time stuff. We talked about more some, some legal stuff. That was how I got in touch with him the first time. First time I ever heard from Robert Jordan was a cease and desist letter. But, you know, we can <laughs> talk about that in a little while. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, that, sounds, that sounds interesting. But yeah, that's an interesting way to start a, a, what ended up being a relatively uh, good relationship. Yeah, it's true. And so we started off, you know, on this very, you know, you know, formalized kind of thing. My first emails to him were, you know, dear Mr. Jordan, right? And then after a while, it was, you know, me saying, you know, dear Robert, hmm? you yeah, know, whatever. And then he started <laughs> signing, and then and I, I kind of went based on like how he signed his emails because the first couple emails to me were signed, you know, Robert Jordan. Mm-hmm. And then the next one was, you know, RJ. And then after that, he just started signing them Jim. You know, and because his real name was Jim, you know, and Robert Jordan was a pen name. And so 
And so, yeah, by the time we got the, t- by the time I got the sending emails saying, Hey Jim, you know, as opposed to dear Mr. Jordan, <laughs> the tone of our emails had changed a little bit and were far more friendly. And, and so when, after he died, I remember I had lost a hard drive or something. So I lost a lot of those emails and I was bummed because I wanted to keep them. And so I sent an email to his assistant, to Alan, and I said, you know, D- you've got access to all this stuff. Do you ha- can you forward me whatever emails that he might have kept? And he said, well, he didn't keep a lot of, you know, here's what we've got, you know, digitally. But he printed up a lot of the emails between you guys. But the ones that he printed weren't the ones about the legal stuff. And they weren't necessarily about the ones about the real time. It was the ones that he said where I said, like, hey, I just bought my first house or, you know, my, my huh. I just my, my first, you know, my, my oldest son was just born. And I'm thinking about doing this in my life or, you know, I'm thinking about trying out, you know, this kind of thing for filmmaking or so like it was all the more personal things that he kept. And, you know, I, I never learned that until after that um, says a lot about died. him as a person, I think. And I it think does it's insight too. Into, to character and into people's inner life. Yeah, yeah. That he put on the page. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and so that always, you know, that was that was something that really touched me. You know, it, you know after he had passed away. But let's see. While, while we're talking about Robert Jordan stories, I, <laughs> Go I've, for it. I've got yeah, I've, I've got two here. You guys can pick which one. Do you want to hear about okay. that cease and desist letter, or do you want to hear about how I thought I had almost killed him and in oh, downtown that's Oakland, tough. California. I, I want to. I want to hear how you almost killed him. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine what happened with the cease and desist letter. I'm I'm pretty familiar Something with that story. Something to do with Dragon Mount, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to hear how you almost killed Robert Jordan. All right. So this is no. That's good. That's it. And this is in the uh, on the Knife of Dreams tour. So this is his his last book tour. Sadly, his last book tour. And before he had yeah. So it was on the, it was on the Knife of Dreams tour. And as we were talking about earlier, I'm out in Northern California. And at the time, I lived in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area right there. And a good friend of mine at the time worked for Pixar Animation, you know, the big filmmaking studio. Cool. And so my friend Brad and I, he, uh, Brad was a, a big um, Wheel of Time fan. He actually, he and I had met years before in line at a Robert Jones book signing. That's how we met. And we're still really good friends to this day. And so Brad suggested, hey, if Rob Jones could be on tour and he's going to be in San Francisco, do you want to let's give him a tour of Pixar and maybe take him out to dinner? I said, that's great. Let's do it. So I made the arrangements through Robert Jordan's publicist and and actually through him. At one point, he this is 2000, what, 2004, 2005, something, I guess 2005 when the book came out. And one day my, my house line rings, you know, I still had a house line back in 2005 and, <laughs> and it's, hello, this is Robert Jordan. Is Jason available, please? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'm like, Robert Jordan's on the phone for me, you know? All right. <laughs> you can answer that. And so, you know, he was, it, it was just calling, you know, he wanted to, needed to confirm, you know, some stuff, you know, please make sure that, you know, the Pixar guest services has, you know, my, my legal name rather than Robert Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yes, okay, we, we got it covered. Thanks, you know, no problem. But it was fun to have Robert Jordan call my house. And I so would have freaked we, out if Robert Jordan called my house in 2005. I, I know, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I lost my it, mind. It, it was very <laughs> surreal. Like most experiences that I, like all the experiences I had with Robert Jordan, they were all very surreal. So we go and do this uh, Pixar tour, and um, Lee Butler was on that tour. I don't know if you guys, she did the Wheel of Time reread on tour.com. Um, yeah. This is this is shortly before she started the reread. Well, actually, I guess the reread started years later because it was after Rob Jordan passed away. I think that they started it. So is she the one that wrote a whole blog of of a reread. Mm-hmm. I refer to her what she writes sometimes. So the Lee was big into the Wheel of Time Usenet group way back in the pre dating Dragon Mount and everything else. So back when you know Usenet was a thing, and she was pretty active on there. And at one point, she was reading. Um, she was running the Wheel of Time FAQ, the, the frequently asked questions page. Mm-hmm. She was in charge of that. That's so that, she that's was my a, favorite Wheel of Time website from way back when. Before yeah, Dragon Mount. Because uh, just all the speculation on there is an inspiration. It, it, it's older, and it's fun to go back and see the various eras of that site. And that's that, that's another big that's another big project that we're undergoing right now. 
It's I a, reference people back to that. When they ask for a no-spoiler summary, I send them to the archived version of The Wheel of Fact, and I say, well, look at whatever book you're on, because there's no way there's spoilers in there, because the other books hadn't come mm-hmm. out yet. Hadn't come out yet, yep. And so that, that page is currently, it, it's something that's run on the Dragon Monster. We, we took over, we took it over, it sounds so aggressive. We uh, <laughs> volunteered to... So it's not a hostile um, takeover, you're fine. <laughs> all right. We, uh, we volunteered to host that going forward because it, you know, it needed a home and it was, a, and we had the staff and resources to be able to maintain it. And so currently it's down right now because we're doing another ma- major update for it. Mm-hmm. That's like, you know, a, you know, 2.0 upgrade kind of thing. So, but that's under construction. But so yeah, Lee, Lee Butler ran that and I, she was a, a friend of mine in you know, acquaintance and um, digitally, but I'd never met her. And I knew she was living in California at the time. And so I said, hey, would you like to, you know, I, I called her up and or emailed her and was like, hey, would you like to hang out with Robert Jordan and go to Pixar and go to dinner afterwards as a group, you know? And she's uh, like, uh, yeah, yeah and can I bring my sister, you know? <laughs> so, so we did this and, you know, uh, we're all waiting at outside of Pixar Animation Studios, which in and of itself is pretty surreal and cool. And a limousine pulls up and Robert Jordan, and Harriet, get out of the car. And so we did this, we <laughs> did this tour and it was as cool as you kind of would imagine. And Harriet was giddy. I just remember her turning to me and she gets huge grin on her face. She's like, it's just like being in a Star Wars movie. <laughs> 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 so after dinner though, we, Brad and I had arranged for a couple um, dinner choices and we, had called ahead to two different restaurants and said, you know, hey, we're um, we'd like to make these reservations, and you know, these are tentative reservations, but you know, this is with the VIP, so we'd like to have you know the, your best room, and we'd like to make sure the service is on point, and this is someone you know very special to us, and you know, and VIP kind of thing. And it was like a nice Italian restaurant, and then we wanted something you know just for some flavor, and you know, it was a it was Moroccan, I think, is what it was. It was a Moroccan restaurant. And so we uh, had both these – Moroccan with belly dancing. That's what it was. And so, sure enough, we um, you know say to Robert Jordan afterwards, hey, we've got these two choices. We've got this nice Italian place, and we've got the Moroccan place with belly dancing. Which would you prefer? And he looks at us <laughs> without missing a beat, of course, as you imagine, and he says, well, the belly dancing, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like the obvious answer to me as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Tinker's Dance uh, like that, so I can imagine. Right, yeah. I always and figured so that's like, what okay. that is. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're like, okay, well, we'll just get in our cars and your limo will take you there. And so Now, here's the thing is that um, I'm going to lay this squarely at my friend Brad's feet. Brad was the one who was in, in charge of selecting these restaurants because he worked there in the area, right? And so it turns out that this Moroccan place – was not exactly in the best part of the neighborhood. Uh, they're um, awesome. <laughs> Pixar is located in Emeryville, California, which is right adjacent to Oakland. And Oakland, as maybe some of you know, there 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 are some parts of Oakland that are beautiful, and there are some parts of Oakland that you really it isn't always advisable to be at late at night. And so, uh, especially if you've got, I don't know, you know, say like a caravan, including a limo and a VIP with you. And so <laughs> how, how bad of a neighborhood how, was it? Did, you, did know, I, you, you can Google downtown Oakland and then you gotta go. For well, that right now, so. I, I've heard stories. I've, I've never, I've never been myself, but I've, I know some people who are from the area. No, that's it. I don't want to be knocking Oakland. Oakland is beautiful. And I have recently, even, you know, or the last couple of years, I have walked through downtown Oakland at night and it is a beautiful place. And, you know, it's the home of the Golden State Warriors and yeah, you know, so great. Things change. Things change. <laughs> I think I could no longer afford to live in the neighborhood that I used to live in in Brooklyn, New York. So that's, you know, yeah, that's, that's true. how that goes. It's a, yeah. But anyway, so this whole thing, the place we went to was was more than a little bit shady. And so that's what, you know, that's that's a part of this. I'm starting to get like, oh, man, where where do we bring this place? And, you know, we parked in this you know, dingy, nasty parking lot or whatever. And I distinctly remember, I, again, like I, all the funness in the world. And I have uh, since actually made donations to help in this kind of thing or whatever. But I just remember that there were two people who were curled up homeless and like, you know, shivering and just cold and like we're walking right past them. And it's like, ugh, this is, you know, not the sort of venue I'd anticipated bringing, you know, Robert Jordan, my special guest to or whatever. Like I said, I did 
I sure I went and I donated to uh, after this. I went that memory of those homeless people was very strong in my mind. I ended up making donations to a charity in the area, thinking about that afterwards in Robert Jordan's name. But anyway, so we get there and this Moroccan restaurant, they're not ready for us. They have got, you know, they're like understaffed. We waited forever. And in a Moroccan place, there's no like chairs to sit in. And so we were all sitting in beanbags and, and, you know, <laughs> Robert Jordan's like, oh, well, I've got bad knees. And I'm like, oh man. And so, yeah, it's, he's physically uncomfortable to sit around. Uh, uh how, that's how big rough. was the party? They weren't prepared for us, you know, and which I couldn't believe because I had called ahead explicitly about this. They weren't ready for us, so the wait was incredibly long. Finally, they got us to a place or whatever, but, you know, and we you know, said, hey, can you bring some table and chairs? You know, just, you know, physical comfort here. And, and so they did that, and the food was late. The food wasn't that great, and belly dancing was like an afterthought of one person who did it for like a minute or something like they kind of like belly danced around the table once and left. And and so it was this very underwhelming experience. It did not go how I had been (laughs) imagining it, you know? And so it's all the worst because you want to impress him, right? Yeah, exactly. Or at least, yeah, you know, or at least, and so in, he was physically uncomfortable. He was not as chatty as he had been in other times that you know we had gone out to dinner or hung out or whatever he was kind of withdrawn and so and then you know as soon as the dinner was out you know they were they were off and gone now they were also in the middle of a tour and i get that you know and having been on a tour i know it's not like it's just you're exhausted at the end of the day and sometimes you just need want to go to your hotel and because you got to get up at seven o'clock or six o'clock for a flight the next morning or something right sure but, you know, at the time, it just had this, I was like, oh, my God, like, I've run to this horrible place in this, you know, shady part of town. Whoa, oh, my gosh. And I didn't hear from, even after the tour was over, I you know, kind of sent some follow-up emails. I never heard from him, like, for, I don't know, several months afterwards. And I thought, my God, he's really kind of mad at me. And it was shortly after that, that that's when he announced his diagnosis with amyloidosis. And which was, you know, the disease that ultimately claimed his life. Mm-hmm. And so it was just, you know, I remember relating a portion of the story to Harriet at his funeral and saying, you know, like, yeah, I just, I sad that, you know, the last time I saw him, you know, I, I you know, that it was such a horrible dinner, frankly. And you know, I was like, is he mad at me or something? <laughs> and she said, he said, no, you know, she, we were sitting next to her on her porch and she kind of patted me on the knee and said, you know, no, he wasn't mad at you. You know, he uh, he loved you and he loved all his fans and you guys collectively. You guys were always so good, you know, to him on the, on the tours and stuff. So, so that was a story that you know ended happily. But I definitely at one point was like, what am I getting Rob Jordan to? I'm gonna get him killed here in downtown Oakland or something, whether it be by you know bad food poisoning or whatever. I, I don't even know. Uh, so I I'm actually curious. You know, I've I've heard a lot about Robert Jordan. But I haven't heard a whole lot about Harriet, and I was just wondering if you could say a few words about her, because she seems to be so heavily involved in the series. Oh, yeah, I would be interested to hear that, too. You know, I I know I've heard Brandon Sanderson talk about her once or twice, but I haven't heard her talk. And I was just curious if you, you know, could say what what you know about her and what she was like. Yeah, I am. It's hard to say where to start with Harriet. Harriet is someone I'm very close to. She's a, an amazing person. One of my first impressions of her was that it was true what Robert Jordan had always said, in that he said um, pretty frequently that all of the fem- the major female characters in The Wheel of Time are based off of her, both, you know, the, the good ones and the bad ones. And... <laughs> Like different and, parts of her personality? Yeah, and I think what he was getting at, and, that, and that's true, is that you you spend a little bit of time with her, and you, and you can kind of start to see that. I mean, she, one of the uh, main adjectives I would, I would describe to her is that she is strong. And I, she has a, hmm. a strength of character that is impressive and even inspiring. She balances that with... She's one of those people how who listens more than she speaks, and you can see how that's a wise thing to do. And so when she does give an answer, when she does speak, 
you know that it comes from an informed place and Mm -hmm. it's with conviction. She strikes me as a woman who also has a bit of vulnerability to her that is, you know, that does not diminish that strength I was just talking about. I think it's something that she has, you know, an Aes Sedai-like masterful control over. And I, I, I don't think I'd ever want to play poker with Harriet. I think she probably <laughs> has, you know, the, the, and she probably taught, Rob Durham apparently, you know, was a, was a poker guy. And I imagine he probably learned a lot from his wife on that. That's she, interesting. Um, yeah, she definitely is a, is a formidable person, but she's also very sweet and very kind. And um, you guys, I know you guys are planning, it's my understanding, to come out to Jordan Con this year. And I hope that for everyone listening that you'll, at some point, you know, either this year in April or another year in the future, usually in April, that you will attend Jordan Con, the annual Wheel of Time convention that's held in Atlanta. We're planning um, on getting there, there this year. Definitely. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And I look forward to meeting you guys there in person. And uh, yeah. Harriet, Shake your hand. Harriet will be there. She's there every year. And yeah, she, th- this year especially is going to be a big year. Um, she will be there. Brandon will be there. It's going to be a, a wild ride. But yeah, so Harriet's there every year. And one of the things you can do. Well, this is the 10 year uh, anniversary of Jordan Con, right? This is the 10 year anniversary yeah, of Jordan that's Con. That's a big correct. deal. I didn't realize mm-hmm. that. Yes, the 10 year okay, anniversary. Okay, now we have to go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be good. This is, if anyone's ever been on the fence about it, this is the, this is the year to go. There's going to be, um, uh, it's the 10 year anniversary of um, Jordan Con, the 20 year anniversary of Dragon Mount. We're having, Brandon doesn't go to it every year. He usually only goes every other year or sometimes every once every three years. So this is a year that Brandon will be attending. And uh, there's usually, and the more, People like that that arrive, you know, we brand is such a big presence that when you know, he comes, you know, a lot of when the dealer hall fills up, you know, other uh, um, people are interested in coming, and we've got more editor, we've got editors and publishers and stuff showing up. So it's a, it's going to be an exciting year. So um, bring your recording equipment and be ready to ride. So <laughs> that's that's definitely true. I would love to to have a chance to sit down and, and talk to a bunch of the people at Jordan Con and yeah, you should do it. Do and um, actually, podcasting and yeah, yeah. There's another um, Wheel of Time podcast group that they do a live show, so they work with the convention and then they get they they in the past they booked a room or not a room like a, like a one of the rooms where all the events are happening, and they host a live recording and they just turn on the microphones. They invite their guests to sit at the table, and there's a live studio audience. Shenanigans ensue. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so yeah. So if that's something that sounds that, like um, a blast, yeah, I yeah, would love to is. do that. And I, I know, you know, we've got some of our fans. I'm sure are going to be there, and I'm sure I'd love to meet them and have a chance to to thank them for supporting us too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so and it, it's a great. I mean, it, it's a lot of fun. Just and, having a, a point and a time and a location where we could get everyone together would be really fun. I'm trying. There's always a trivia contest every year that they do, and it, it's insane. Like, like I think I know. I, I've been, I've been running Dragon about 20 years, and it was a, I was a fan for you know another 10 or whatever before that. How many times have we all read the series, or whatever? And I'll show up at these trivia contests and just get mocked left and right. With, oh yeah. Uh, the, I, like, there's no way I can hold a candle to some to some of the people out there. So good times. Like. Bring bring your best game for all you listeners out there. Come to Jordan Con. Bring your best Wheel of Time trivia. If you think that you're the... Uh, that would be so much you know, fun. It would be fun it, to go it, there and lose. <laughs> uh-huh. exactly. I'm sure I'd get exactly. schooled. Yeah. You know, we we are the first to admit that we uh, we certainly don't have it all on the tip of our tongues. We have computers in front of us. <laughs> right. we, we have Google, <laughs> for yeah. those of you who can't, don't know that already. <laughs> Tarvalon.net hosts a big... Every year they host a... Uh, or at any of their big conventions, they hold um, or events, I should say, they host a, um, a a toast where you know that's and that's usually that's something most years I think it's open to the public where you know you just uh, can show up and everyone sends a big circle and you toast your friends and memories and you know and whatever else and it's a big real time community. There's there's a sword fencing contest where the winner is proclaimed a blade master because as we all know, <laughs> it takes. It takes a blade master to anoint a blade master, and Robert Jordan started this himself by declaring 
two people that, you know, two fans that had demonstrated their sword prowessness <laughs> to him. <laughs> and uh, he said, I hereby declare you Blade Masters. Go forth and make more Blade Masters. And so every year there's a big tournament and, and uh, every year a new Blade Master is, is tapped. So, you know, we've got... What are the rules of the tournament like? Like, how do, how do they run that? Or do people use, like, fencing gear or are there, like, fake swords or... So we use Heron Mark Quindelar Forged Blades, and if you survive, then you are. <laughs> that's it. They use, I think they Eternally use Eternally foam... razor sharp. <laughs> yeah, they use they use uh, foam padded swords, and yeah, you you're given a fencing mask, and I think you sign cool. waivers. I, I have to do that. <laughs> Again, it, the the competition though is surprisingly good, and so. I've done it before. I've not yet been a blade master, which is kind of the point because I, I am a I'm a martial artist and I, I study this stuff. And um, <laughs> but no, I um, I came I got second place a couple of years ago, and then every year that I've tried since I I've like lost early on. It's like the competition just getting tougher and tougher. But yes, do, please do you have come. to do you have to be first place to be called a blade master? Yep, and the first place winner. Only one. The, uh, I think so. So there's only what like ten or eleven blade masters so far. I believe so. Yep. Wow. I believe so. <laughs> that is a rare title. Mm-hmm. It's kind of cool. That is really cool. Yeah. So uh, let's see other things that there's. Well, okay. Well, what I was going to get the reason I brought up Jordan Con, but not just a plug for it. What because? Oh please, plug away. Yeah, Harriet goes to it every year, and one of the things you can do is you can at the if I think it's like first come first serve. You got to get there quick. You can sign up for, it's like a coffee hour, but there's some fancy kerfuffle term or something like kerfuffle snatch, I don't know. Uh, fireside <laughs> don't chat. Know. It sounds right to me. It's a fireside chat kind of thing where you can sit down in, in a small group with Harriet and it's like you and 10 other people sit down with Harriet for an hour and just chat and have coffee. And they, Brandon has one of those. Alan and Maria, who are part of Team Jordan, they have them. Usually other various guests. I think I'm going to have one this year. With with me, which would be the first time that's ever happened. So oh, cool! Be kind of fun, you know. We'll I, be first know. on the list, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I understand. Like, you guys are going to ch- chat with me now and call me anytime uh, or whatever. I'm but, just you know, with you. But, but really, you're going to really have to, to do that. <laughs> go to the one with Harriet over the one before me. You know, <laughs> before you do mm-hmm. that, because Harriet, of course, has you know just these fantastic stories and so much insight into you know what it was like to live with Robert Jordan and what it was what he was like as a person and it's just uh, I, I never get tired of hearing her stories if you guys get a chance do a search I don't have the link handy but maybe put in the show notes for everyone else if you're curious about Harriet the best interview I ever saw with her which was fantastic was a interview that happened at JordanCon a couple years ago by Theoryland, Theoryland.com, which is the big uh, another one of the big wheel time sites run by Matt Hatch, who is incredible and who you should interview at JordanCon. Matt Hatch of Theoryland.com did this interview with Harriet maybe four or five years ago, something like that, and it's still up on his website. You can find it, and it's just the most amazing insight into her life because they talk about a lot of things about about her upbringing about how her, you know, whenever you read about her and Robert Jordan and how they met, it's usually you hear some variation of Robert Jordan's side of the story, like the version that he told to interviewers and the version that he told the fans. And then now we have Harriet's side of it, and it's kind of fun to hear her take on things and her take on his early writing and things like that. You know, not only was she, of course, you know, his wife, but she was also the editor on the Wheel of Time series. Oh, sure. And, uh, yeah. And so, I, you know, I credit her with as much of, I mean, maybe not as much of the, of the book as him, but I credit her with a huge portion of what these books became. Oh, just there's no doubt about being it. Being there yes. and across the kitchen, kitchen table and I'm sure mm-hmm. talking to Rob, Robert Jordan constantly and, and of course, yeah. editing. I'm sure, I, you know, I, I have a hard time. Not a hard time, but I, I almost feel that her name should be on the cover as much as his. And I don't have any insight into that. But, you know, sometimes I think about the fact that they were a team and they really worked together to write these books, as far as I can tell. Yeah, you're spot on. You're correct. And I think that that feeds beautifully into one of the major themes of the series, which is, you know, of course, the, the balance of power and the balance of gender equality. That was something that was, you know, 
a major theme of the books, right? And so mm-hmm. and here it is, you know, being lived out in this way of Robert Jordan and, and Harriet. And, you know, she absolutely had a, a huge impact on the series and, you know, was significant. And even if, you know, she didn't, like a lot of times when, you know, she'd get the first draft of a book and she was learning a lot of these, you know, events for the first time herself. I remember asking her um, back when Robert Jordan was still alive on one of the book tours, I asked her, you know, like, how much do you know of the ending? And this is probably like in the early 2000s, you know, when like Crossroads of Twilight or something was coming out, you know? And I asked her, how much do you know? And she says, oh, I know a few things and a few big things, but a lot of it don't. And I'm discovering right with you. Now, you know, she gets it, you know, the first draft hot off the press, you know, hot off the printer, right? Right. And so. I always figured before that, you know, if you're living with someone and writing this series of novels, like you're going to be talking about it, bouncing ideas off them and stuff. You know, and I, you know, that's a great point, too, because I remember I, I think I asked Robert Jordan that thing. I said, how much do you talk about this with Harriet? And he said, he said, not a lot because that's work. Oh, yeah. And it was, it was uh, kind of interesting. It's like, you know, sense. it's a great point. Like, you know, it's, it's their, I mean, sure. They probably talked about it, but you know, I, I also kind of get the impression that, you know, that he, he had his vision in mind and, you know, for, you know, certainly there are times we all know that, you know, that maybe his vision got a little too big and a little unwieldy at times, you know, <laughs> with, with, the, with the scope of it. And, and you know, that's, that's part of what that series became. But at the same time, you know, he truly did have, he knew where, you know, he was going. And, you know, despite the slog of of some of the, you know, those, you know, middle to later books, you know, might've been a slog at times, but he he knew where he was going and there's no doubt about it. And there was some, and that's, you know, backed up not only by the notes, but, you know, by the fact that, you know, Harriet has said that, you know, this is something that he, you know, the ending was, you know, was there it was on paper and, i don't think so, he could have been nearly as internally uh, coherent as he w- was without knowing where he was going you know there were there were things that were foreshadowed from the very beginning that came true in the end and make sense through the entire series and if it's if he ha- didn't know where he was going there's no way he could have just discovered all of these things working out in a way that was really convenient you know mm-hmm. Without Taviran, you know, (laughs) things could go crazy, but he just built into the story the idea that everything pretty much was going to come back together. And he did so, you know, in a a masterful way, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, And I got to argue with you on this log. I love this log. I think I'm one of the few people who thinks that that's like the best part of the books. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and uh, um, I'm with you on that. I I love to. I I look at, and I say this a lot to people, is that I look at the series as this great big long symphony and you can't have everything be a crescendo the entire time you know there's going to be highs and lows there's going to be valleys and there's going to be these long stretches and you know this is not you know it's it would be mischaracterizing the series to say that it's the story of just one or two or even five people it's the story of the world of a society facing the end times and yeah that certainly there's going to be your you know your primary protagonists and heroes and everything you're going to, and naturally the story is going to you know, follow them in a large way, but it's I, also I like your musical analogy, because I think that where Jordan has a chance to get really detailed and really into some of the more intricate back and forth between the characters and the subtleties of what's actually going on is in that slower part, you know, like, like when a musician yeah. can really, mm-hmm. you know, they're not, slamming down on the keys they're playing a really intricate piece yeah, i have to true. say i'm looking at this i was just googling around for that interview you were talking about a second ago and i ran into an npr interview with harriet and the first question of the interview is if you had to sum up the series for people how who hadn't read it what would you say and she says well i'm going to quote my husband and who apparently said in an inter- interview when asked to summarize it he said cultures clash worlds change cope Mm-hmm. There you <laughs> yeah. go. And there's nothing about in there about about an individual savior. There's nothing about there in you know destiny or anything that points to it. It's just what he said. It's about this wider thing. And I think that's one of the things that makes the Wheel of Time timeless and unique is that it is it, it certainly it's an examination of how do we cope with you know these end times. How do we cope with insurmountable um, or seemingly insurmountable 
challenge is, how do we cope with it as um, individuals? How do we cope with it as, you know, groups? Like, how do we, you know, um, you know, uh, how do we... Yeah, as uh, entire cultures tribes, or nations. Yeah, you know, tribal kind of thinking or whatever. And then, yes, as a global thing, how do we approach this? You know, are we going to, you know, set aside differences and come together for a common cause? Are we going to just double down on our bickering and let it overwhelm us? I mean, that's... That's really what he was exploring in so many levels, both, you know, from the whole, I mean, think about the, the whole. That is a really is cool way to look at it. Yeah. Death is lighter than a feather. Duty is heavier than a mountain. We have an individual responsibility to step up to a challenge. And, you know, the men and women thing, it, the channelers, you know, when you channel separately and as individuals, you are going to not be as powerful as if you put your differences aside come together and find harmony to create, you know, the, the things you need to do to succeed. And so, I think of the quote in the last battle when Rand is talking to the dark one and he says, it's not about me. It's never been about me. And then he goes on to quote, you know, it's about a woman torn and beaten down. It's about a woman with a secret. It's about a man whose family was taken from him, you know, and he lists all of these people who are characters in the series. But that whole paragraph to me is like, you know, I know it. this is a hero's journey for Rand. But the story isn't about Rand. It's, it's the about journey all of the people. All of the people. Exactly. Yeah. And so that, and that's exact. I mean, that is fun. And that, that's pure Robert Jordan there. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if more than likely, I'm guessing Brandon probably typed that paragraph, but I guarantee that that's part of, I mean, that was in, those were in his notes. And um, you were talking about, you know, the secret notes at the, or the not so secret, you know, the, the notes that Harriet had in, in the carriage house that she donated to the College of Charleston that are, you know, somewhat public now, and some fans have gone and, and seen copies of. Um, I've seen chunks of those notes, and that, what you're just talking about, that paragraph, again, I don't think the paragraph that's in the book was physically actually typed by Robert Jordan specifically, although who knows, it may have been, but but that idea right there, that, 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 was, that was him. I mean, that was, you know, that was his whole vision. That was one of the things he was going for at, at the very end. It's not... And it was not something that, you know, Brandon said, oh, well, heck, I got to come up with an ending and a climax for the series. You know, that was. Yeah. Uh... No, and, and I think that's really he was building to that statement the whole time he was writing the series. That 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 idea is throughout the whole series. It's not just in the last book or the last three books. It's stated yeah. there with clarity, but you can you can see it uh, internally consistent throughout the whole thing. You know, we were kind of talking about this while we were recording for an episode last night, but it's. Like, the story really isn't about Rand, even though he's, you know, the main protagonist. There's there's so much more going on. It's one of the yes. reasons why I think The Dragon Reborn as a book is such a, an excellent book, is Rand's almost not in it. Yeah, The Dragon Reborn <laughs> is not in The Dragon Reborn. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you are spot on with that. I mean, that's a great observation that a lot of people have made over the years, is that you're right, that book called The Dragon Reborn barely has The Dragon Reborn in it, and it... You know, that, and that comes back to, you know, again, you know, just Robert Jordan's experience where, what, what he was working through when he wrote those books. I mean, he tells a story. Have you guys heard the story, Robert Jordan, or read about his story where he talks about the, the Iceman? Have you heard about that? No. What's his name? Utsi, the Iceman? I, I don't know. But the, the story I know that he tells okay. is that he says that there's a photo of a Vietnam soldier, and this photo is of a soldier in Vietnam, and he's standing, you know, by a doorway, and he's eating a burrito completely at ease, and nearby at his feet are there's a, a pile of bodies. My recollection of it, that this photo was of a soldier that his platoon or his group, I should say, I don't, I don't know what the term is for, but you know, his, his band that they referred to that person in the burrito as the ice man, because, you know, you could just see like how cold and turned off and, you know, to the world and, you know, how like ice cold this guy was in that, in that image. And they you know, called him that for a bit. And it was a picture of him, of Robert Jordan. And hmm. it was something that he I mean, I, I can't, I, I can't speak for him, you know, so please don't say I can't speak for him, but it was my understanding that that was where he was at at one point in the war. And he realized that and realized the downside. And so fast forward however many years, 
and he's writing Randall Thor. And so every time you read about Rand, how cold he has become and how much he has to distance himself just to survive. I mean, we, you know, it, the books talk a lot about just like, you know, what would Rand, like if Rand didn't have that void, if he didn't have that buffer, that if he didn't, if he didn't distance himself, could you imagine how he would be crushed by the weight and the horrors that he has seen? I mean, what that guy has seen and been through and gone through and what he had to do, he had to, who had, who he had to become at least for a while, before he could, you know, undo that and ascend to where he had to become. But that was, you know, that isn't just... That we isn't talked just, about yeah. Rand as a really excellent depiction of PTSD, as someone suffering mm-hmm. from PTSD, as well as, some, uh, you know, Gwyn and some of the other characters. There seems to be a, a real consistent thread of, of, this, of trauma. Actually, quite a bit of it. Do you think yeah. Darth Rand is a... <laughs> Robert Jordan kind of put himself in there, his war experiences. I know he served in, I think it was Vietnam. I, I don't know, right? But from what I've read, and also just having the, being a writer myself, and I've never been to war, but I, one of the things I have learned is, right, and there's, you know, there's a term that a lot of writers use, and, you know, I, kind of a pithy thing when I first heard it, but now I'm starting to really kind of get it, and they say, write what you know. And, I think that was something that he was doing. I think that this, I mean, absolutely, our experiences in life inform our writing and, and our create, creativity. You can't, it doesn't matter what I'm writing about, you know, as a writer myself. I mean, like, I've never been to these fantastical worlds. I will most likely never travel to distant colony planets and all this other kind of stuff, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but in there, you still are, you can't help but put a piece of you onto the page. And so when I can very much imagine Robert Jordan, as he is trying to imagine what, you know, this young Rand went through, you know, as a young man, and he was probably about the same age. And, you know, Robert Jordan was a, was a physically a, a big guy. I remember the first time I met him, uh, he was, I, I, I'm six foot five and he was eye to eye with me. And that was, was surprising. And he, you know, <laughs> I'm a thin guy and he, he outweighed me natural body mass <laughs> I mean, We've always remarked yeah. on how tall he makes the male characters, and uh, mm-hmm. it made a lot more sense when you realize how tall he actually was. He, how he tall was, was yeah, Robert you Jordan? Know? I, you know, I don't know what the official line is, but it's probably six four, six five. You know, six five. Oh, oh wow, yeah. I didn't realize. Yeah, he, he was. For, I don't know, maybe six five. Maybe I, I'd put him maybe six three, six four. Is probably what I'd say, but who knows? You know, he. Uh, my point there, though, being that, you know, he, um, I think he related to all three of the, the main Taveran in in his own way. And I think with Rand, it was very much, it was the soldier aspect of him. And that, you know, who he was as a soldier, I think, primarily came out in Rand. Well, in the original draft, wasn't the Rand character a, a bit more like T- Tam? And a, yeah, a bit of an old man soldier. Exactly. He wanted it to be. That's exactly it. Yeah, it was, it was a man. And then, the, again, you think of his, you know, his experience of wanting to, uh, of coming back from Vietnam. He had seen these horrors and he was gonna, and he was done with it. And so he, yeah, the original, original concept for the real time, the, the main character who later became Rand was basically Tim. It was this older 35-year-old guy. And then, you know, for various reasons, you know, hey, decide to make it I just younger. turned 36. Be careful when you say older 35. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, yeah, you young pup. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, one of the reasons that you know, he made Rand younger was um, in large part because, you know, it was – as a, you, you want the reader to kind of experience the, the world along with your main characters. And you know, just as like Harry Potter is – seeing Hogwarts for the first time, you or the reader are experiencing Hogwarts for the first time with him. And so with Rand, you know, the first time Rand sees Camelin and meets the queen, you know, you're staring wide-eyed at the queen of Andor right there, you know, my goodness, and her eyes to die. You feel it, you're like, you're with Rand with it. You know, you're channeling and reaching for Sidene for the first time you're there reaching with them and stuff. It's easier to do that when you've got a, a younger person, whereas, you know, if he were 35 years old, you know, or and and older and jaded or whatever, then, you know, you'd see the queen, but, uh, queen of Andor, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It kind of puts a yeah. little bit of it in, in this kind of story. I put a little bit of a distance between you and the reader. So I'm sure he would have succeeded if he had made him 35 in his own way. But, you know, that's, 
That's my well, understanding in a, of problem. In a lot of ways, Rand, Rand is the ever, every man. You know, it's he's a little bit of a blank slate for you to put yourself onto. Um, yep, and that's that harder that to do when you have a 35-year-old retired soldier. Yeah, that's not a blank slate. No. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that's that's a good point there, too. And so, and a lot of that, you know, older... I mean, we, we have, we have uh, you know, both Tam and we have Lan, and they represent, you know, at least, you know, two of the, you know, main uh, male version of that, that kind of represent that older, more dignified, world-weary kind of person. Ruark's another one, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah. later, we get a, later we get a few others. The you know. sort of grizzled, wise veteran. Yeah, exactly. I, I think know. of them as the father figures in Rand's life. Yeah, that's a, mm-hmm. that's a good way to put it. Yeah, that's a good point too. So, yeah, geez, that, and there's like a progression there. Tam, Lan, Ruark. Yeah, and then, and then the, back the to same Tam. thing is yeah for the uh, you know for the women too. It's the same thing. You know, we have um, Moraine kind of gives way to you know Kat Swain and you know that's uh, and then back to Moraine a little bit. Um, a little bit. Yeah. But uh, going back to the uh, the whole idea of you know the the veteran you know coming home after the war or whatever. So I'm pretty sure we're, we're, we're five years past this or whatever, but I, I will say spoilers for the very last scene and chapter of the series here. So, you know, uh, <laughs> spoilers um, on a podcast Those, called Watch Spoilers. Yeah. You know, um, the, uh, a big part of the name was so that we didn't have to say it before we. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's, it's in the title, know. you're not allowed to be mad. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Got it. All right. So in that last scene, you know, when, when Rand is, about to ride off into the sunset and you know does this whole channel the pipe thing or make oh we were gonna ask you about that yeah Yeah. we want to know what your opinion on that is or what your theory personal theory you know all right i'll come back to that then so yeah okay but in terms of that what he's thinking in that moment uh, you know he's not thinking i'm gonna make this thing make this pipe light no what he's thinking is he's thinking about all the things interestingly he's thinking about all the things that those early notes said that main character was going to, was going to think about. He's thinking, Rand is thinking to himself, I've had enough of war. I've had enough of palaces. I've had enough of Kings and Queens. And I just want to, I just want to have a pipe and and enjoy a good fire kind of thing, you know? And so that was what Robert Jordan, that was what Robert Jordan had initially kind of conceived of, you know, this, this proto Rand character that we're referring to is that, you know, he's this older, more experienced person who had come home from this, all these horrors and just wanted, he had seen enough of the palaces. He had seen enough of war. He had seen enough of what he just wanted to pipe in a fireplace kind of thing. And so it's interesting to me that that's where that was the, one of the initial nuggets of, you know, that, that launched the series. And it's also appropriately, it's where we end up. It's where he ends up, that character ends up anyway. And so in some way, I mean, again, it's just, that is pure Robert Jordan. And I do know that he actually wrote that scene. So, you know, mm-hmm. there, there it is. He was a pipe collector too, right? He was. Although I never saw the pipe collection, interestingly enough. Or if I saw it, I was probably more caught up in the sword collection. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would be. But was he a smoker? Uh, There's certainly a lot of tobacco in the series. He was a, um, he certainly was a, you know, pipe tobacco kind of guy. But I don't, my understanding is that I don't think he was a cigarette or kind of guy, nothing like that. That's, it seems suiting, the pipe. Yeah, Yeah, definitely, you know. You can say, I mean, you've seen photos of the guy. I mean, like. Yeah, he sort of looks like he should have a pipe. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Well, I wonder how much smoking you actually do out of the pipe. I know my father used to carry around a pipe just uh, for the smell. I have, yeah. They, they. It's completely different from cigarette smoke. Definitely. There was a uh, a bookstore out here in in California. It's now closed. It was called Bay Books. It was um, located in Half Moon Bay, California, and it was a really well for many years. It's a shame that they closed down, but for many years they were um, just one of the the best science fiction, fantasy, independent booksellers around, and they were kind of known for that and. And Rob Jordan went there every year and he, on his tour, or every tour he went there, he made a stop. And I think he requested, because they had in the store, that was a bookstore, it was a kind of a general bookstore, but it definitely had its heart and soul in science fiction and fantasy. 
it also had like a tobacco room. Not like as in like they <laughs> sold like rare cigars and they sold, mm-hmm. you know, pipes and other, you know, stuff like that. And so it was, I, I remember he would do his book signings there and, you know, then be like, you know, afterwards, you know, I need 30 minutes. <laughs> you need to go in this little <laughs> sealed off room to, you know, pick out whatever you're going to get. So. You, you know, the other trick, the mosquitoes in uh, South Carolina. South Carolina, yeah. Mm-hmm. Huge. Yeah. <laughs> and persistent. And a little bit of pipe smoke goes a long way to driving them off. I have used that trick camping myself because I'm a, I'm a smoker. I'll put it out there. But it, it totally works. Or if you put a, a, like, make a low, a fire that's not burning very well. Yeah, smoky fire. You guys mentioned the, the mosquitoes of South Carolina it made me think of you know, sitting out there on the porch. So Harriet has, Harriet and Armadur, they live, the home that they lived in has been in Harriet's family for many years and my understanding, very, very many generations, you know, they're in the deep South and their home has this wraparound, like many homes in the area and certainly of that, you know, period, had this big wraparound deck on the outside. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I remember asking Wilson. Wilson is Robert Jordan's cousin, very close friend of the family, but he grew up like a brother to Robert Jordan. They were that close, although they were biologically cousins. And that's why a lot of times, if you'll see, if you Google around and, and Google Wilson and Robert Jordan, while Robert Jordan was fighting his disease that ultimately claimed his life, wasn't able to you know, post his update statuses you know, on his blog as much as um, he would have liked, and so Wilson kind of took over that that job of doing so. And so Wilson frequently would sign his uh, his emails or his blog posts as Wilson, you know, the f- fifth of fourth brothers, you know, because Robert Jordan had three siblings, so the four boys, <laughs> and then he was the fifth of, of them. But anyway, so I remember asking Wilson somewhat more recently, maybe on I think it was during the yeah, Wheel Time Companion book tour. I, I was when my first book, Mystic, came out and we were, I was on tour with him. And I remember asking Wilson, um, you know, just the thing about Robert Jordan, about Jim, was that he had this amazing ability to, he was just a natural storyteller. And we all know that, but it, take, away the, take away the books. He was just a person who could, everything he said was just this like, you know, this I don't know, it felt like an epic tale. I mean, I realized he had this this <laughs> deep, powerful voice. And like I said, you can hear a little bit of that in that audio clip that, that's up on the front page of Drag Him Out right now. We found this old audio clip. And there's others of them out there. I just happened to find that one recently, like on my hard drive or something. That's so a I wonderful one. Put it up. Do you yeah. mind if I yeah. snag a little clip from that and put it in the sure, beginning of the free. podcast? Okay. Absolutely. He, yep. he sounded very lyrical when he spoke. It almost yeah, sounded like he had planned it. Who killed Asnodian? Someone has deduced exactly who killed Asnodian using the evidence that I have presented in the books. The evidence flying across the toilet, I think that this shows that it can be done. I have not told that person that they presented me with a correct deduction. <laughs> I insist that it is intuitively obvious to the most casual observer. And besides, I'm enjoying watching his squirm. He just, he has that, that cadence that was, you just yeah. you don't find a lot of people that have this, that have that, that feel to him anymore. And, uh, yeah, I remember the, when I first met him, the very first time I ever met him was in 1998 on the Path of Daggers book tour. It was in San Jose, California. I went to this tour, and he got up and he did a reading from Path of Daggers. And he read one of the chapters where the Sanchen are preparing for, for battle. And I can never do it justice, but he got up there, and we're all just, you know, kind of, you know, there's 400 people in this crowd, and we're all kind of milling around. And, we start, and then he starts talking, and 400 people go utterly still. And not just because he's for polite silence, but because this guy, there was something special. And to this day, I wish, I wish, I wish I had recorded it. I'd give anything to have that recording. He oh, yeah. read, and to hear him say, Ashimod, you know, was just, it 
floors the whole place. Like a, a shockwave just kind of goes out and he says, he says, to rockin'. And you get the goose, you know, I get goosebumps in my arms, you know. He, you know, he doesn't, I say Rand Al Thor. I'm from California, so it's Rand Al Thor, you know. And he says, Rand Al Thor is how he says it. And There's almost a musical quality to his voice in those clips. There is. Yeah. And so I asked Wilson, I said, you know, what is it about him that was like this? I mean, one time we were talking about straight. He was basically telling me at the dinner years later, or one time he was telling me the story ultimately boiled down to that. There was a, there were some stray cats in his, in his neighborhood or something like that. Right. But he says that there was an uncut Tom prancing <laughs> about my yard, you know, <laughs> and it's just, it was amazing. Like, you know, it's just, it wasn't, it was like he was, I bet he probably dictated the series. I don't even know. Yeah. So I asked Wilson about this and he said, well, he said, think about it. He said, you know, in the South, not everyone had air conditioning. And so they spent so much time out on the patio and with the humidity down there, they would sit out there because it was the only place you'd go to get cool. You couldn't be in the house or no air conditioning, especially in your previous generations. And so you were just sitting there. So all you had was to tell stories and you just got good as a culture of telling stories. And that's a, that's something that has stuck around and for a lot of people and certainly stuck around you know, in, in his family. And so he got used to having, you know, just telling stories and hearing stories and combine that with the fact that he was, you know, supposedly and infamously was, you know, reading, you know, uh, Jules Verne by the age of five and things like that. He was, he was a very advanced reader. He clearly was someone who had, was a, you know, was an intellectual kind of guy, very smart. And so you combine that with just the natural cultural and probably personal affinity for telling a story. You've got a voice like that. And there you are, a, a born natural storyteller and, Singer, uh, yeah, I, I only heard him sing once, but apparently a really he was a very good singer. Oh, he yeah. was a singer. He was a singer. Um, I, I don't know if he's like, I don't think he recorded or anything like that. I didn't but know that. I think um, Harriet posted um, one time about his tombstone that she placed for him. And it took her a while. To, like, it was something that she placed like years later. Uh, I, I should get this right. Maybe someone can Google it while we're doing this. But I think it says warrior, poet, singer, or something like that is like what his gravestone says. Maybe a warrior, singer, storyteller. I, I forget exactly. But it was interesting that she called out the singing aspect of it. And um, the, the time I heard him sing was um, was at Comic-Con. We were at a dinner one year, Comic-Con in San Diego. And uh, I asked him about this, kind of like, hey, I hear you're a singer. <laughs> and he had, enough, he had had enough to drink by then. And so he just belted out this, Elvis impersonation, <laughs> and it was surprisingly <laughs> good. And like most things that Robert Jordan did, it you kind of you know blew me away. And I thought, oh my god, who is this man? And we, this is a special guy right here, you know. So yeah. Oh, did you find it? There it is. So it says, let's see, a father, storyteller, soldier, singer. There you go. Four words to describe. Him. I don't hear too much about his kids. So Robert Jordan had no biological children himself. He and Harriet never had children together. But that said, he was a um, a father figure to Harriet's son, Will. Will is a great guy. He's oh. I've I, I met him a couple times, and um, he he sometimes come, he came to Jordan Con last year, and he was around. He himself, I understand, is a um, a poet and. A, um, I think a musician of some kind. Yeah, so he was, you know, a, a, a boy when Jim Robert Jordan came into his life and married his mom, and so I know that he had, um, uh, you know, he def Robert Jordan definitely played a father-like role in his life. And there's some stories that that Robert Jordan told over the years. You know, one of the ones that I've heard the most is that his, when Will was in his young teens, they played Dungeons and Dragons together. And now, for all you D and D players out there, that imagine, is the coolest thing ever. Imagine your DM being Robert 
Jordan. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right? I mean, like, so. Maybe sometime, like, yeah. You know, if you guys end up meeting Will and at Jordan Con and interviewing him or something, I don't know, ask him what those campaigns were like. I, I've never heard it. That would be really interesting to, to know what those were like. <laughs> so, he, well, Will was was the, the son that he had. And I know that after he passed away, too, Will posted on Robert Jordan's blog um, that um, he posted a nice entry talking about some of the memories he had of him so yeah. well i've had you talking for a long time but i have two more questions if you still have a little bit yeah i, I got time yep happy uh, to answer i would love to know if you know anything about the tv series or if if you have if there's anything you can say about it or are you not allowed to talk not? about it <laughs> <laughs> no i i am i am right with you guys on this one i Previously was involved to, to different to some extent that at the time I really wasn't allowed to talk about and you know because I was under NDAs at the time on, on previous efforts to bring it to the screen. But at this point, no, I am I am no longer involved in any capacity with anything that's going on. The I know what you know, and and that's kind of about it. So darn. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I obviously we're really excited about that, and we're hoping that it that it does come to fruition and is done well. Because I'm sure. Yeah, me is. too. I I yeah. recently I did I have been the one thing I can say I guess is that I have been in touch with Rafe Judkins, the the showrunner, but only to the extent of me saying, "Hey, Rafe, I'm the you know I'm Jason over Dragon Ball. You know, mm-hmm. you want to any chance we can interview you?" And he said, "No, nope, you know, sorry, it, it, not time for that stuff. I'm you know." Uh, they they lock me down, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, and I well, as long as he's that, locked down, that's an encouraging sign that he's at least working. You know, it's, or it's it, still it, moving forward. So yeah, something you know, is. I think happening. so. <laughs> my my understanding of it, and I am not a show business guy or expert or whatever. You know, you can probably uh, go ask Narg the Trollock over at Wheelatime or you know, Adam Whitehead um, yeah. on his blog. Those guys will have more informed information that I will have. But my understanding is that what, what it really kind of comes down to is that we can have all these over the years. And I can test this right. You know, writers have come and gone on these projects over and over and over and over. And, you know, there's been big name actors and big name directors. And there's been, you know, studios come and gone. All these people have been attached, but until you really get someone to say green light and say yes, you can use my money to produce this <laughs> and make this you know multi million dollar project, then you know we're nothing's really going to get done. So right now, even though Sony has it, we're I think they're looking for you know they're looking for a Netflix Funding. or someone else to kind of come along. And so, and I think I don't know this, this is my own speculation, but I think you know it doesn't take a genius to kind of see that, you know, Netflix was a, it was a big hope probably I'm guessing for, you know, producers for, for a place to land there. And, you know, the fact that, that would they be a just, dream for fans, Netflix yeah, it would, it would produce some really nice stuff. It, it, it definitely would be for sure. You know, although they just dropped, you know, I think somewhere around $1 zillion into, well, you know, the Lord of the Rings, um, a right that they just acquired. So I'm guessing Wasn't that Amazon, was that Amazon? Oh, I'm sorry. Amazon. That's what I was saying. But uh, see, there you go. This is why you shouldn't listen to me. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. No, no I, I, I see. I see. Netflix the would be cool. Yeah, yeah, Netflix would be cool. Yep. No, I mean, I, I, yeah. So basically, you're in the same point we are. Where we're, we're all we're all hoping that somebody picks it up, and we're all carefully watching everything else they pick up, and being like, "Why isn't it the Wheel of Time?" Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, maybe because it's like two million words or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's that too. You know, and there's also, it, you know, I think from a creative standpoint, there's. I love the Wheel of Time, and it, it has, you know, it, it is unparalleled in any genre, especially in the fantasy genre, I believe, especially once you get past, the, once you get into about the second book, really. And the first book is, is great. I love it. But it does have a, intentionally designed to be so, a very familiar, a lot of tropes that we're familiar with, you know, you know Young sure. Man Farm and, uh, you know, Dark Rider, like, you know, I think we commented on more than a few of those. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it's like you know, you can just do a face replacement on you know the, the hobbits in, in for the first thirty minutes, and you've got the opening of the Out of the World almost. And so, I think that creatively, there's a lot of challenges and 
things that need to be done. And also, like we were talking about, this is a story that's more than just Rand. But at the same time, the books start with just a pinpoint focus on, you know, Rand and the Two Rivers kids. So, you know, how how do you tell it in a fresh way and to make it expand? And I think that for, for I would imagine that for executives who are looking to, you know, not just the fans, but like executives who are thinking like, hey, how do we make this appeal to, you know, not just fans, but to uh, the average person out in, you know, Idaho and, you know, Florida and wherever, you know, just uh, average regular people have never heard of the Wheel of Time, you know? Right. What's the appeal? What's the appeal? How do, what's the hook, you know? And if the answer is, well, these dark riders that come to a sleepy little town, you have to flee in the freak dark one, they're going to, eh, come on, you know, what else you got? And we know as fans that there is so much in the wheel of time that there's plenty of fertile ground and the answers are there. They do exist. It is a unique and amazing series that would really shine, but it takes, it's going to take the right team of people to dig up those, those, those nuggets, you know, those golden nuggets and, and to find the vein of gold, I should say that runs throughout the series. That's going to really shine, but a straight adaptation from, you know, page one on, is probably I'm going to guess, and again I have no insight of this, you know, um, what they're looking at these days. I'm guessing that they're, they'd probably look to shake it up a little bit. And I don't know how they would, you know. They're probably looking at every option. Yeah. Well, thanks. What was like, your oh? And question? then I guess I just wanted to ask you a little bit about Mystic and your book and what sort of uh, oh, yeah. spurred you to write your own book and what that process was like. So, you know, I set out to write this big 14-book epic series. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, you and know, you ended I, up um, with a trilogy, so you did the exact and, opposite and, of... <laughs> right, yeah, you know, and well, who knows? You know, maybe we'll, uh, we'll go beyond three, but... <laughs> no, you know, I appreciate you asking, and that's... Um, with Mystic, I've always been a, a creative person. I've always been a writer. You know, when I was a little kid, I was... You know, my parents had a typewriter, and I you would write little stories on the typewriter when I was, you know, seven or eight years old. I think, um, the first story I remember writing, I don't know if it was, was my first one. It's the one I remember though, was, um, some karate kid fan fiction. So that was nice. Uh, good times. You know, it's a good start. Uh huh. Everything's been downhill since then, you know, but, uh, <laughs> Well, that's what but, happens when you start too big right off the top. Right? Yeah, exactly. We, we aspire to, to high things like that. So, uh, yeah, so I've always been, been a writer, and um, that led into um, when I was in college, I, I got my degree in computer animation. You know, I wanted to work at places like Pixar and do visual effects for movies. And what I learned from that is that it's fun to do visual effects, but, you know, just I could never find a project – that I would be excited about. So I thought, Hey, I can just write my own projects. And so I would started doing some screenwriting and then I, that kind of led me into, well, no one's going to direct this stuff. So I'll just direct it myself. So I started directing my own projects. And then, you know, for a good 10 years or so, I was, I was just, I mean, I was just, <laughs> just doing short films and uh, I was, but, but that was, it was those 10 years that I really kind of credit like my, where I, you know, cut my teeth on learning to tell a narrative story, how to learn the craft of storytelling. And I did it more from screenplays. And, um, but, you know, I also was reading, you know, about more traditional prose and kind of following that. And obviously was still involved in the publishing industry through Dragon Mount and the Wheel of Time and everything. And then when I had a young family and, at, you know, as those years went on and, that meant I had less time to be out gallivanting with the film crew recording stuff. And it meant I had less money to be investing in, you know, independent films and less time to be hunting down financiers and angel investors and all these kind of things, you know. And it was also when YouTube was showing up and you just the way that short films and all film was being distributed and viewed was changing so rapidly. And, you know, eventually got to a point where I was just like, Hey, I really want to just tell these stories I've, I've got. And so mystic actually my first book, which is what is currently of mine that is published and available. The sequels coming out this July mystic was initially conceived as oh, cool. an idea for a short film. And it was, 
the premise at the time, as I had kind of pitched it to some of my friends and that we were going to work on it together, was a very, very, very simplified version of what the book ended up becoming. But it's basically young apprentice to be, an aspiring apprentice, come goes out into the woods and is seeking to become an apprentice to a, to a, this reclusive mystic that's living out there. And so that evolved the same into the book once I finally said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to try writing this as a traditional story. And so I switched from writing in, you know, final draft, you know, you know writing screenplays to writing in Microsoft Word, or Scrivener as it would be. And I kind of had to shift the way that I wrote. And I had to, it took me a number of years to kind of learn to write well in that in that way, I'm still learning. You know, I'll yeah, know. you know, I've, have you written a lot of practice pieces to get ready for yeah, something for sure. major like that? I, I definitely did. I, I wrote uh, a couple short stories that, you know, nowadays, you know, you know, a, a short story a year or so ago, I wrote a short story and I wrote it in like a couple days. You know, the first short story I wrote was six, seven thousand words, and it was at the time, and it took me you know six months, <laughs> and it was just because I was learning how to write and learning how to revise and learning all the things that you kind of do. And then I ended up I wrote a novel that wasn't fully finished. It's still not fully finished, but it's long. It Maybe word count wise, it's a hundred. And I think it's about 180,000 words, which is oh. almost, it's like, you know, a 250 page novel. And hard, it's a pretty big, it's a good, you know, it's not a Robert Jordan sized book yet, but it's on its way there. And that <laughs> book, when it's done, will probably be two, 250,000 words. So it'll be a, a Robert Jordan sized book when it's done. And that book, um, I learned a lot about writing on that book. And I actually stepped away from it because I thought, you know, I just, I, I love the idea and a lot of it is working very well, but I, it was a big epic fantasy, and I'm just, and I said, you know, I'm just not quite ready yet for that. I, I, this book means too much to me. I want to come back to it, but I'm just not quite ready. I'm going to go write something. I'm going to take everything I've learned so far, and I'm going to roll it all up. I'm going to start with a blank slate and just see what I can do. Something that's a quicker story but something that's really well told something that is not doesn't have six or seven different viewpoints and act one and act two and you know and all this kind of stuff just a straightforward story and so i went through and found those old notes that i had for this for that mystic short film that i wanted to make i thought huh i can take that and so i took that and i turned it into the novel i started you know from a blank slate and just started writing and rolled up all the experience and knowledge that I gained, you know, from, from my filmmaking years and from the years of writing, you know, that other book and the short stories and working in a um, really, having a really great writing group helped teach me. And so I rolled that all up and that's what became Mystic. I sent that off to Tor, you know, who publishes Robert Jordan and Brandon. I sent that off to Tor. They uh, came back fairly quickly and said, you know, this is great. We love it and we'll take it. And, you know, they said, well, love it. You know, let's buy it. And I said, well, actually, it's a trilogy. You want the other two? <laughs> as well. and, uh, and they said, yeah, you know, give us a pitch for the other two. And so I did. I sent a synopsis of the next two books. And they said, yep, we love it. It's great. You know, let, let's do this. And so. Wow, that's so cool. Was, was that, I assume you have gone through the publishing process before. So, you know, knew a little bit of what to expect. Or was that like. You know, that was, I, I know the writers listening to this are you know, going to be shaking their fist at me, but... Um, <laughs> I was going to say, that, that I, it was way too easy. It's, it, it, I don't want to say it was easy, because I'll come back to that. <laughs> sure, because, sure. Because I have thought to myself, like, that was kind of easy. So I knew from years and years of working in Dragon Mount, I had gotten to know a lot of the people at Tour Books. Uh, the president of Tour Books and the publisher is, is Tom Doherty. And Tom was a personal friend of Robert Jordan's. He gave Robert Jordan's eulogy, in fact, at his funeral. And I remember I was standing next to Tom Doherty and, and Tom's wife, and we were standing at Robert Jordan's grave, like literally at his headstone. And the three of us were standing there, kind of a quiet moment, and it may have been Tom's wife, I, I think it was Tom's wife, turns to me and says, so Jason, do you write? And this was, huh. after my jaw kind of like, you know, I rolled it back up off the ground, right? <laughs> I 
I had a really lame answer. And because at the time I was doing the filmmaking thing, whatever. And so I was going, oh, yeah, you know, mumble, grumble, screenplays. Rah, 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 rah. You know, I had a really lame answer. And then it was a very kind of defining moment for me. And I've, I've talked about this before, where I went home from that thing. You know, Tony Dort basically just asked me if I'm, being, you know, if I'm a writer and if I did stuff. And I thought, I had a lame answer. And I need to have a better answer for that. Because I was at that point kind of working on my own prose and kind of getting away from filmmaking. I thought, you know, the next time that I'm, the next time that I see him, I need to have a better answer. And so that was really one of the big things that kind of catapulted me into forcing myself to sit down and get serious about, about writing books. And so sure enough, a couple of years later at a convention, it was at Worldcon in Toronto, was there and Tom George was there and I saw him in the hall and I was like, hey, Tom, you want to have breakfast or something? And he said, sure. So we were talking and I said, well, you know, Tom, do you remember that time? <laughs> that Robert Jordan's thing. And you asked me and, and he kind of had this look. I'll never forget. He had this kind of look in his eye. Like he knew what I was talking about. He kind of said, yeah, you know. And I said, well, you know, I, I took that to heart. You know, I, I think I have... Uh, I think I'm going to be pretty close here to having something I'm going to want to share with you, you know, a book. And he said, you know, tell you what, Jason, he said, you know, when you have a book that you think it is ready, ready to go, send it to me directly. Just, just email it to me. And I thought, holy moly. <laughs> like, uh, and, you know, now some people, some people oh, kind of wow. like, you know, said, yeah. I kill wow. for that connection. And some people would say, oh, that was easy or whatever. But, you know, think about, think about it this way too, is that at that point I had spent probably 15 years cultivating sure. a business relationship with him, with his, with his publishing house. I mean, I knew, I know, you know, so many people that work there and, you know, I've hung out with them, had beers with them, had dinner with them and stuff, worked with them in a professional that capacity. Helps. So, so in you know, the fact that like, this wasn't, you know, just out of the blue and also, you know, it was something that, you know, he knew I at least had the wherewithal at the time, you know, to put together a website and to host a blog and to talk about the wheel of time a lot and stuff. So, you know, I can... Well, and that was before those things were commonplace or easy to do. Yes, exactly. And so it wasn't just like, you know, hey, you know, it was that easy. I mean, like I, it took, in a lot of ways, it, to get to that point where he said, you know, email me your book when it's ready, you know, it took me 10 to 15 years of cultivating relationships and then, you know, 10 to 15 years of, you know, learning to be a writer. Now, at that point, I hadn't written a word of Mystic. I had, at that point, I had only been writing my other book. And when I told him, I think I have something for you, I was thinking about this other big epic fantasy project I was telling you about. And I went home and had a panic. I was like, there's no way I'm just going to send this crap to, to Tom Doherty. It's so not ready. And that's kind of when I had my, like, you know, moment of, like, I need to sit down, roll up everything I've learned so far, start from scratch, and just write a really strong story. And so I took... It was about a year. It took about, um, you know, again, it was about a year at the time. It took me six months to write it, maybe another seven or seven months, six, seven months to revise it. And uh, and again, a lot of it because that was the first time I had done those things. First time I had finished a draft and then thought, huh, I've got a full first draft. Now what? And I had to figure that, you know, you know nowadays, it, uh, fortunately, you know, it doesn't take as long to revise a book. It, you know, at least when, for me, that's not a you know, 80,000 words. So I sent Mystic off about a year later to him. And that's when he said, you know, Let, let's do this. So it sounds like yeah. he was the uh, impetus for at least two major shifts in your writing uh, or two it, forward steps. It was. And for sure. I mean, like uh, the tour has been, been great to me before I was published and after I've been published. I feel very fortunate uh, and proud to be, you know, a part of their, uh, collective family of writers. It's really great. They're, uh, it's ramping up again because um, a sequel, uh, Mystic Dragon, is, is all done. Or at least, you know, it's got, it got to go through, you know, one more round of copy edits, I think, but it's basically done. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, that book was, uh, it took a while to come out. We got that, um, you know, I wrote that book during a very tumultuous time in my life personally. I was going through a, a lot and uh, had a lot of a lot of difficult times in my life, and so I was. Uh, I went through a divorce, and my father died, and there was a lot of other stuff going on. So it took me a while to kind of get through that one. But now I, in hindsight, I think that a lot of. It's interesting that you know that that, that second book, Mystic Dragon, was the first one. As I was saying, it's about you know, this young girl who's you know full of hope and you know this bright, optimistic 
character who's you know aspiring to be a mystic and she goes to a, a master trying to become an apprentice and that's what the book second book's about the first book is about excuse me and the second book you know mystic dragon is all about just it all kind of burning down and catching up on flames and just dealing with you know the, the chaos of everything and then here is much of that is happening in my life and so it just it uh, kind of almost by accident became this thing where life imitated art or art imitated life. I don't know. Maybe if I, well, I think we started ways. the night with write what you know, and it seems like that's uh, what you've been doing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, but 2018 is going to be a, a, a big year because that, that comes out. I do have uh, another novella that uh, I, I can't quite say yet what it is, unfortunately, but, uh, but it's, it's a, um, a novel. It's a novella, but it's a novelization of of an upcoming role playing game, computer role playing game. So I'm working with the, with the game developers on that, and it's a nice. pretty. I'm pretty excited. It's one wow. of my um, one of my big. It's something that you know, die hard role You're playing a busy guy, Jason. Yeah, I've got that. I've got got a lot of things going on. Come a couple other projects in the works too, and so I think 2018 is going to be a fun year. And I get to meet you guys at Jordan Con, so that's the cherry on top. We're really excited about that. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that seems like a good place to wrap it up. It does. It does. That was that was fantastic, Jason. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I'd love to yeah. do it again sometime. If you Definitely. don't mind, you know, two hours of your time. You know? No, no, no we do all. this all the time. So this is this is our favorite thing to do. This is honestly, we we don't have more fun uh, in our lives other than sitting in this basement and having these kinds of conversations with other people who are nerdy and love the wheel of time. So Mm -hmm. you in some ways represent the ultimate person who's in love with the wheel of time. And, you know, I've, I've known your name for a long time and it was uh, just an honor to talk to you. I I think it's been, been fun for me and, and certainly for Patrick. Yeah. I feel even more now like what spoilers is a part of the community, right? That's cool to feel connected. It does. Yeah. It feels really cool to feel. Well, you know, I, and speaking of that, you know, I think it's fantastic that there are, here we are 25 years or whatever it is into, you know, the wheel of time and, we still are having new websites, new podcasts, new fans coming to it. I mean, there's a... I can't know, tell, tell you how many people are like, I've, I've discovered it last year, I read through mm-hmm. it, and I'm doing my reread, and I looked for a podcast, and I found you guys. That's there it is, yeah. The most common story we get is people... Yeah, and that's, you know, and that's the most common thing that, you know, that, that I've always had, too, for Dragon Mount, is you know, people saying, I'm doing a reread, or I just discovered it, and I Google it, and there's a website, and there it is. And so that's, I mean, that's how these things go you know so I, I look forward to interviewing you for your 20 year anniversary in you know, uh, <laughs> 2038 let's set put it on the calendar now maybe tuesday five o'clock you know we'll done do that. done <laughs> the third reread <laughs> right yeah <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?